beautiful. And we're going to talk about hematopoiesis. So when you're saying the word, do not forget that there's an I in it. I know sometimes even when I say it fast, I just say hematopo, but it's hematopoiesis because using etymology, we're going to be able to figure out what it is we're talking about. So what in essence, we mean is the protection of everything cellular. Platelets are a form of cells, but the red cells, the white cells, this is not about plasma production. This is just about all of the other um, cellular bodies that live inside blood. And we're going to talk about where they are created from and their growth cycle. How do they age? And so if you're just looking at it from an etymological term, hemat being your root, O being the combining form, what does hemat O mean? Do you remember? Blood, right? Poiesis is like the creation of, the production of. And when I say blood, I'm talking about a lot of cells, right? And so when we're thinking about hematopoiesis, we can actually break it up into two general classifications of where they start. They all have one P cell that could turn into anything. There's one cell inside the body and it can then become a white cell or a red cell or a platelet. And it has to do with different um, inclusions of different, um, it's called a cytokine. It's kind of like a nutrient base, a, a trigger, a progenitor, meaning that's the, the originating cell. So from one originating cell, we can have two different groups of cells. One of them we call the myeloid group. And in the myeloid group, we're including most of the WBCs and the RBCs. And the other group, lymphoid, we're really only dealing with one white cell, we're dealing with a lymphocyte. So that's probably the easiest way to remember it. You got two groups, lymphoid means lymphocytes, everything else is a myeloid cell. And once from the originating cell, the body has determined with all of the different nutrients what it's going to become in the future, it starts to grow in a very predictable way. We know what this map looks like. This is kind of what it looks like in a very ugly fashion. This is not exciting to me at all. I don't think that this is a fun way to learn, but I do want to stop here for a moment because it's the most simplistic representation of how this happens. We have one stem cell. One originating cell could be anything. And you've heard stem cells before. What do you hear about stem cells in medicine? Right, you, exactly. Now you know why they're so important. People can take stem cells, preserve them, and that's been helpful for us, not only to treat, say, uh, recovery from a trauma to the body, but also they're doing genetic work on stem cells to help at a, at a growth level of what fetal growth can do with a stem cell. And one of the reasons why they collect uh, the umbilical cord and bank it is because stem cells, those originating cells, it can become anything. Once you mix it with the right kind of energy and the right kind of nutrients and the right kind of hormones, once you mix it with anything, you can tell it what to do. Now the body will do that based on what it needs. And then it'll decide if it needs to be a myeloid type cell, which means that we've got this group here. Um, those of you at home, I think I walked away, you didn't see me. I'm gonna put it on here, this group here, the megakaryocyte, which is your erythrocyte, erythrocyte being RBC. So it can either be a myeloid cell that turns into an RBC, or it can be a myeloid cell that turns into a white cell. And then over here, if it's decided to become a lymph cell, it'll only ever end up being a lymphocyte. There's a couple different kinds. It gets kind of complicated. We're not gonna go crazy deep in it on this one. This one's just about how they start. And then after study break, we have a lecture on each individual cell. We'll talk a little bit more about them in depth. But this is not 
the prettiest version of what hematopoiesis looks like, this is much better. Now it looks a little bit more complicated. I'm not trying to scare you. We're gonna walk through it today. And at the end of the conversation, I'm putting the same slide up. And then I expect that I am going to rock this lecture and you're gonna know exactly what all of this means. But let's just breaking it down. This tells you everything you need in one picture. It shows you where the stem cell is. It shows you that it could be a myeloid or a lymphoid cell, shows you the different stages it takes to grow up, and then it shows you what it could possibly become. Same here. The end is platelet, the end is red cell, the end is basophil, neutrophil, eosinophil, or a mast cell. If you look down the left-hand column, it shows you where these things are occurring in the body. So the stem cell, and all of these giant baby cells, they happen in the bone marrow. They live there, but they do need help from two other key organs in the body, depending on which cell it's gonna to become, to trigger it to turn into red or white or lymph, okay? And then from there, it floats around in the blood, and then sometimes cells leave the blood and go into tissue to do more work. And that's CLP 400 work, where I teach you that in, in a year from now, I'll teach you what that looks like. For now, we're just gonna work up here. We're gonna stay in this bone marrow area, eventually ending up to the cells that are gonna end up in blood, okay? So they always have to be produced. We're never gonna be short on what our blood cells should look like unless there's a pathology or a disease. Why that's important for us is because technicians are busy measuring the numbers of cells in blood every time you do a complete blood count. If we know that there should be a healthy number of cells and that the reproduction of these cells should be consistent, anytime we come across a shortage of cells in our CBC or we see too many cells of one type in our CBC, that should trigger us that there's a problem. And it's usually got to do with a disease. Some kind of disease process or trauma process has happened in the body and the body's response is either inadequate, meaning there's too few cells now in production. For example, it could be something like anemia. We don't have enough red cells being produced the body doesn't have enough red cells, meaning it now doesn't have enough hemoglobin, meaning it probably doesn't have enough oxygen. Patient comes in because they're tired, they're sleepy, they might even have a blue tint to their lips. Really what that means is they don't have enough red cells. So why is the body not making the red cells? We could have the same question if it's a white cell. And knowing in the, like, when we know what each cell does, it'll be easier for us to think about whether I have too many of that cell and too little of that cell, what it is we could be looking at. So depending on um, particular animals, you might get slight variations in the reproductive timelines, but this chart gives you a pretty good idea of how frequently the body is making these cells. And it's in very small increments of time. In some cases, it's just hours. Eosinophil is produced every 30 minutes. The body is constantly making these white cells. I mean, it's falling down a little bit. Um, the one that takes the longest is your lymphocytes. What disease is impacted by lymph? Lymphocytes. A it's a common human disease too. It kills a lot of people. I think no family is untouched by this one. Cancer. You can have a cancer in your bone marrow. And if you've got cancer in your bone marrow or bone cancer, all of that is impacted, specifically your lymphocytes. And that's anyone who's been impacted by cancer and you're asking about what is your T lymphocyte count? What is your B lymphocyte count? They're talking about this. If you've got cancer in your bone marrow and your bone marrow is required to produce all your blood cells, you can see now why this becomes so serious to the body. And we have lymphatic cancer and bone cancer in animals too. So this is not gonna go untouched. You're gonna see this. So when does it start? Well, it starts even before the body is completely formed. It starts in utero as the different organs are being developed. Key 
Organs are the liver, the spleen, the thymus, and the marrow. Okay? And as the animal is growing in utero, these organs have different powers and strength of powers in what it is that they're growing. So the cells can still start in the marrow place, but the thymus really is a, you're learning this probably in anatomy, it's a growth organ. And that particular organ is meant to work specifically in the growth of the animal. And it in fact shrinks as they become an adult and you really don't deal with a thymus as an adult. A thymus is something that's in a prenatal animal or a neonatal animal or a, a, a young animal under probably even one, okay? But as an adult, we're really just dealing with the bone marrow. I do, and it's just because I want you to know it. I don't want you to say, Kirsty never told us that. I do have to tell you that if something is wrong with the bone marrow, let's go back to this cancer, it is sometimes possible that the organs initially from, from when you were in utero or when the, when the animal was in utero will kick back in to try to compensate for gaps in cellular production and they'll try to initiate hematopoiesis, but we really are talking about marrow as the general production source of our cells. So hematopoiesis, like we said, was blood production, but we also know that we've got different kinds of cells. I said we had red cells, white cells, and platelets. So what do you think erythropoiesis is? The production of RBCs, yes, Mandy. And leukopoiesis? Yes, Mandy. Thrombopoiesis, that might be one you don't remember, but it's the only one left. There were, yes, platelets. Thrombo, leuco, and erythro come up over and over and over again. And it's not just in hematopoiesis and it's not just in CLP. It'll be in other organ systems. It's just got to do the leuco and erythro specifically is that color, right? But you're gonna hear those repeated over and over and over again. So you've, you've not remembered them or learned them from etymology, learn them. You need them over and over constantly. Here's an example of, we're going to start with erythropoiesis. Here's an example, a really nice image, specifically of what happens in the creation of red blood cells. Okay, so we talked about the stem cell being in the bone marrow, that one big cell in the middle, that will be your stem cell. This one right here. <clears throat> So it comes from inside the bone marrow, and while it's inside, it becomes distinguished based on what the body needs. It becomes distinguished to become a myeloid cell. And then it then is further distinguished to become a red cell. Or it could become a platelet. That's another myeloid cell. Or it could become a white cell. So this direction is erythropoiesis. This direction is thrombopoiesis. This direction is leukopoiesis. Okay. In erythropoiesis, that nutrient, that cytokine that we need to trigger, cyto meaning cell, you think of kind as trigger, cytokine. It's clicking in, it's called erythropoietin. It's kicking in and it's telling the stem cell, I, I know what you need to be. You're myeloid and you're red. Great. Once the erythropoietin is in effect, it is circulated to the marrow. What organ? You're gonna ask me what organ tells the body that you need more red cells? It's gonna be the kidneys. The kidneys are the organ that decides that we need more red blood cells. And it's a great organ to do it. You wanna know why? Have you talked about kidneys yet in anatomy? Okay, well, if you don't quite know it, now you're gonna know just a little bit more. It's probably more of the physiology aspect. 
Your kidneys are a giant filter. So is your liver. Remember seeing liver up there? So is your spleen. Do you remember seeing that up there? Okay. These organs are huge filters in your body, but kidneys specifically. We talked about what blood's function was last week when we talked about the parts, and it carried like nine things, and it removed two. It carried nutrients and hormones, and it carried the blood cells, and it carried the um, antibodies, and it carried, it carried, it carried, it carried. Then it removed waste, and it removed carbon dioxide. The waste removal comes through kidneys. Your blood, after carrying all the goodness and traveling to all of the organs, starts picking up waste, 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 and then it goes through the kidneys. And in the kidneys, there's a beautifully complex, but also simplistic, the way I'm going to describe it to you, process of filtering it out. It drains the waste from the blood. That's what your kidneys are doing. And it's converting it into something you can urinate out. So it leaves the body completely because that organ connects to your urinary tract. What better way to get it out of the body? If you think about it, there's only a few ways we're going to get waste out of the body. You can defecate it, you can urinate it, you can exhale it. How else is anything going to come out? There's really no other way. So the kidneys are spending all its time filtering all of your blood. All of your blood has to go through a kidney, just like it has to go through a heart. Now, not all of your blood needs to go over all of your organs, but it's definitely going to go through your kidneys. And your kidneys can get an idea. Do we have enough red cells? Do I need more red cells? And if the uh, kidneys say, yeah, we do, it puts out that erythropoietin, that cytokine, and it sends it to the red marrow and the marrow says, gotcha, no problem, here we go. Production, production, production. So every time your blood is being filtered, the kidneys are also communicating with your marrow to make sure that there, we have adequate red cells constantly, okay? Is what it looks like. Kidneys are filtering out the blood. It's receiving information about the volume of waste. It's also receiving information about the volume of red cells. It's sending its messenger in the version of a cytokine to the bone marrow. And the bone marrow says, yeah, 10 4, we're on it. And it's producing more red cells. They go right back into the blood, and that loop continues. So what's the risk of kidney disease? What do you think some of the risks of kidney disease? What would happen to the blood if the kidneys were having issues with filtration? Exactly, Alana. Right? And you could start seeing issues with your red cells, which is why patients with kidney disease, they get cold. Right? We start to see them go yellow. It also impacts the liver. It's another filter. We might start to see them have issues with, um, with their oxygenation. We have to add sometimes more water. Sometimes they're not filtering it out properly or they're not res reserving it. There's a whole lot of problems. Kidney disease is very serious in our patients and Cats are prone to kidney disease. <laughs> it's a cat thing more than dog thing. Not that dogs are not are immune. Dogs will also get kidney disease, but there's a, it's a higher incidence in cats. Okay, so let's take a look just quickly at what these cells look like. Full disclosure, I will never, in CLP 100, I will never ask you to find these young cells. I'm only going to ask you to notice identify what a full adult RBC looks like. This is an introduction to this information. You will be asked to look for this in CLP 200 and 300. So it's coming. This is your first delivery of this content. You're gonna get it in more depth with more time devoted to it because you will be asked to understand what this means. So the first cells, and this goes for all cells. The first cells, the babies, they always end in the word blast. Whenever you see the word blast, it's a baby cell. You could probably figure out 
a baby cell of what? Red, platelet, or white, based on the first part of the word. Blast being the suffix, baby cell, giant, huge. And then as they age, they get, well, don't we all? We all shrink and get smaller and like dehydrate a little bit. I know I'm dehydrating as I age. But we're plump and young and wet and squishy and drippy when we're young. And then as we age, we get small and dry and shrivelly. And the same thing happens with a blast to a site. Remember, you know what site means, it's a cell. So by the time it hits the site, it is a cell and it already knows what it's going to be. So when you say rube, R-U-B, makes you think of maybe a ruby. Rubies are red, this is a red blood cell. It starts with one big giant red, nucleus, dark cytoplasm. As it ages, it's a pro-rubrocyte, and then it's a rubrocyte, pro meaning before the rubrocyte, now it's an actual rubrocyte. Still a rubrocyte, but it's differentiating in color, which is why it's poly and then chroma. Chroma means color, poly means more than one. A meta-rubrocyte, all rube. And then you get down, they've called it a reticulocyte, meaning that it's a full cell without a nucleus, but it's an RBC. That's an RBC, my friends. So these are three of the baby cells. There's the last two, the metarubrocytes, the reticulocytes. So why does this matter? Well, it matters because the body shouldn't have lots of these in the blood. Where should these baby cells be? In the bone marrow. So if you're doing a blood smear and all of a sudden you're seeing all these baby red cells, what's happening? First of all, do you think it's important if you notice a bunch of baby cells in the blood? We got a yes? Those at home, you agree? There's not supposed to be there. So one of two things is happening. There's either not enough RBCs maturing quickly, but the body needs RBCs. So it's just gonna release them at any age. Or there's a, yes, there's an issue with the erythropoiesis issue. It's just not aging properly. So in order to figure out where we go from here, us as technicians will understand that there is a life stage to these cells. We're not supposed to see them in blood until they're the full RBC. If we see them a step up, the reticulocyte stage, where they have no nucleus, but they're just a little bit bigger than the regular red cell, they're coming out just a little earlier. But if we start seeing things like prorubrocytes, or a, a rubrocyte, there's either a serious disease in the marrow, or we might have, again, issues with kidney and production of erythropoietin, which is triggering. But that these are some of the earliest signs that you might have a bone marrow disease, is when the marrow is no longer holding on to these babies and nurturing them through their life stages. Okay, let's look at another one. This is still myeloid. We did myeloid red cells. Now let's do myeloid, or what did we say thrombocytes were? Remember? Platelets. Thrombo is platelets. So we're still in the myeloid. We still have a poietin. Look at that. It's a poietin. This time it's not erythropoietin because that would mean it was a red trigger. This is thrombopoietin. It comes from the liver another huge filter in the body. Just think about anatomically where the liver is. It completely bisects the upper portion of the body from the lower portion of the body. It completely bisects it. You are now in half on a sagittal plane, right? It's taking everything from both directions and filtering it constantly. It knows if you don't have enough platelets in your blood. And platelets, as a cell, are the safety net. Platelets are what's supposed to keep the blood in the body. 
So if you don't have enough, we could have a bleeding disorder in place, which is bad. We don't want that. For the thrombopoiesis, the key word is not rubri. Rubri was red cell and meant ruby, right? Red. This is karyo. So you see the mega karyo, pro mega karyo. And you had a blast and you had some sights. But when you see karyo, I want you to think about platelets. It's actually, karyo is more like, it means cell. It's kind of another word to also mean cell. But in the, in the way that we think about it as far as creation is concerned, as far as a platelet cell is concerned, we're using it as karyo, okay? This is what this looks like. The stem cell is still up in the marrow. It's now decided it's myeloid. The liver has said, hey, we need more platelets. It sends thrombopoietin over to the marrow. The marrow says, got you, on it. And now it starts turning the stem cell into a blast, then into a megakaryocyte, then into the later stage megakaryocyte. And then they fraction off into what looks like a plate. And when needed, the platelets all come together. They express out these little projectile fingertips. They touch each other, they become a net, and they clot. Yes? Does one uh, mega carrier say become multiple? Yes. It rips up into little pieces. Yeah. I don't know if you heard that at home, but if you couldn't hear her, she asked if one megakaryocyte can become more than one platelet, and the answer is it does. And so looking at the pictures, the stem cell is in the bone marrow. This pathway is in the bone marrow. The platelet form is what we have in blood. So <clears throat> I'm gonna ask the same question. If we start to see really young megakaryocytes, in the bloodstream, we now have another problem we could be seeing. So I'm not gonna ask you to identify them on a slide. You're gonna build this level of knowledge up, but it now tells us we either have a significant clotting disorder that's requiring us to put out platelets way younger than we should because the body's just trying to address the shortage, or again, we have a marrow issue. <laughs> more cancer, right? Something affecting the marrow and it's, it's throwing off its ability to babysit these little guys until they're old enough to go. Would you say one is more common than the other? Like, would you say cancer no. is more common or the- I, Well, okay. So anecdotally speaking, cancer is pretty common right now across all kinds of animals. Um, different types of cancer for many different reasons. And there's some spe species or breeds that are more prone to others. I'd say um, in the history of my work of 20 some years, I've seen so much cancer in blood. I will tell you that um, in clotting disorders, there's certain breeds that have von Willebrands like a Doberman, and that's a specific clotting disease, not cancer. But I don't see that crossing into cats, and I don't see that crossing into other dog kinds. Yeah, sadly. So we did stem cell threads, stem cell platelets. Let's talk about stem cell myeloid, and then we're going to talk about the white cells that are created through the myeloid division. Okay. These cells, they are the eosinophil, the basophil, the neutrophil, and then the mast cell, they all have granules in them. And some of them are very easy to see. In fact, that's their distinguishing feature when you're trying to ID them in blood is the granules. Some of them are a little bit harder to see, but that's why they're called granulo 
sites, or, and that's why it's called granulopoiesis. It's got to do with what it looks like as an adult. It has these granules in it. Mast cells, basophils, and eosinophils have very distinct granules. In fact, that's how you're going to find them. You're going to look for them. You won't really see granules in a neutrophil. You're really going to look at the nucleus. You can really tell what it is just by the nucleus alone, which is great because it's so prominent. You really don't have prominent granules in a neutrophil. The, the pool that we're talking about is triggered by leukopoietin. Makes sense, white trigger. So we have thrombopoietin for platelets, rubri, or erythropoietin for the rubricides, the red cells. Now we have leukopoietin for the white cells. It comes from the liver as well, but it's not just the liver. It can also come from other areas. So more than one kidney spleen, more than one area of the body can actually trigger the marrow to increase its production of white cells. And what you're going to see is myeloblasts as the baby baby, and then you've got promyelocytes, and then you've got myelocytes, then it works down into band cells, and then it's gonna distinguish itself into other granulocytes. <coughs> Here's an example, again, of each of those stages. I'm not testing you on finding one. This just talks to you about the level of this. This is the picture that's actually the better one to show you. So this image is described in words right here and right here. We start with a myeloblast, which we know then is not going to be, it's a myeloid stem cell. It's not going to be a thrombocyte and it's not going to be a rubrocyte. At this point, when it becomes a myeloblast, it's got to be a white cell. It's got to be one of these white cells. It's going to be an eosinophil, a neutrophil, or a basophil. The promyelocyte is the second stage. You can start to see that it's got those granules in it. If it's going to become an eosinophil or a basophil, the granules stay for the rest of the aging process, but they change color. In an eosinophil, those granules really pick up the pink dye. Remember the dye from CLP? If you haven't had your lab yet, you're going to be dying this week. There are two dyes that we use on a three-step stain. The first step is to fix it, no color. The second step is to pick in pink dye. And the eosinophil granules just suck it up. They love it. And it won't pick up the purple. But if it's a basophil, it's going to pick up all the purple. So we're going to know those cells by that. Mass cells also like the purple. A neutrophil, like I said, you can't really distinguish the granules that are in them, but it does have a very distinct nucleus. So no granules are going to pick up dye in a neutrophil, not unless it's still at the promyelocyte stage. And at this point, we don't know what white cell it's going to be. We just know it's going to be one of the three. So, in addition to talking about the white cells, we do have two very specific cells that come through this lymphoid pathway. We've got a monoblast and a monoblast can turn into a macrophage. So on this slide, your key is that monopoiesis, sorry, let me go back. Monopoiesis starts as a monoblast, which can eventually take you down to a macrophage. A monocyte is what you're gonna find in the blood. And monocytes are pretty cool. They're a white cell, their job, is different from the other white cells, which is why we talk about this process uniquely. When we talk about these white cells, 
this neutrophil, they're the first line of defense in our immunity. They come out and they tackle bacteria and viruses and try to, uh, try to eat it up. This one is an allergic response. They carry histamine, eosinophils. This one is incredibly rare in blood. We don't see it, but they are in the body. We just typically don't catch one on a blood film. Uh, also related to immune, rare immune responses. But this one helps us to clean up the mess of other cells. And in the blood, it circulates as a monocyte, but it more, it's more common for us to be looking for it after it leaves the blood and goes into the tissues. If you've got an infection somewhere in your skin, that's when the cells leave your blood and go towards the infection to clean it up. That's where we get pus from, for example. Pus is after the cells have left the blood and they've moved their way into the tissue to fix the infection. They're eating the bacteria, they're dying, it's like a little war. Then all the little dead cells that used to be white cells, they turn into white pus. They kind of look green because you've got bacteria in there. But if anyone's seen an infection and they've seen what pus looks like, you're actually looking at dead white cells. That's why it's the color that it is. Monocytes in that space, they'll leave the blood and turn into a macrophage and they'll eat all of the white cells that have died. I'll clean them all up, okay? And then we've got the lymphocytes. And the lymphocytes are through the lymphoid, <clears throat> the lymphoid distinguisher, uh, the lymphoid stream from stem cells. They eventually will become either a T lymphocyte or a B lymphocyte. We don't distinguish at that level. We just call it a lymphocyte. Lymphocytes can come out in three different sizes and still be mature. They can be small, medium, or large. but they're not lymphoblasts because just like with all of the other baby cells, they all had a blast stage. So stem cell, myeloid, a lymphoid, blast, blast, and then it turns into different levels of sites until it's mature enough to be in the blood when we see it as eosinophil, basophil, neutrophil, platelet, RBC, or a lymphocyte. So in order to create our lymphocytes, we're using a number of different cytokines. It's not just one. It's not just like a lymphopoietin. It's different than that. Um, and so it, it's a complex process and it's one that you don't necessarily need to know. You do need to think about the erythropoietin. You do need to think about the granulopoietin. And then you need to think about the um, thrombopoietin. But when it comes to lymph, as soon as it ends up in this stream, we know what it's going to become. There's no further differentiation. It doesn't matter on what cytokine it is. It's just a complex grouping of them. It tells the body that we need lymph cells and the lymph cells out they go. The lymphocytes and the lymph cells are unique for another reason. Not only do they not have the granules in them, they also end up in another circulatory system. We have three different pathways in our body. We have the blood pathway. With, we have um, arteries, then we have veins, and we have capillaries. We have the nerve pathway, where all of the different electrical signals come out. The third is the lymphatic pathway. Lymph, lymphatic pathway. It is a completely different set of tubes in the body that carries lymph, which is clear, serous fluid, but it also connects into things like your CSF at some point, and it contains all those lymph cells just by themselves, and it contains them in younger stages because they travel through your body to help with that immunity that you need, the lymph cells do. And lymph cells can specialize to address particular types of infection. That's why you've got B and that's why you've got T. And they are big fighters, but they fight different things. And so with this extra pathway, 
it's not just complicating it through the blood. Like you've got two pathways, you've got the blood pathway and the lymph pathway that are sending lymphocytes to an area. And the nodes that you have in your animals and in us, the nodes are tiny little filters all along the way. It's like traveling the 400 and every little uh, service Ontario is a lymph node. And as you drive, you're carrying lymphocytes, you get off, you go through the node, you get a coffee, you go to the bathroom, so you're picking something up, you're doing something off, maybe you've got to do some work there. You sit, and then you keep going down the 401 to the next service Ontario, okay? So this is your lymphatic system. So let's look at this picture one more time and see where we're at. We talked about the stem cell being the big, the biggest cell and also the most important. It is the baseline. It is what creates every other cell in our body. It all comes from that one. Then, depending on what kind of progenitor cell, meaning stage two, this splits into, we either have one that's going to be a lymphatic cell, or we have one that's going to be a myeloid cell. They all age inside the bone marrow up to this point right here. So there's a line here, but there's also a line here. You can see that they start, it, <laughs> The, the thrombocytes are the only one that goes backwards. They start big and get small. They start big and they get small. They start big and they get small. Same here. This one goes the other way because it kind of explodes into a bunch of different platelets. So one cell can make many platelets, whereas in these streams, one cell makes one cell. Every time you've got one, it's going to age only by itself. They end up in the blood as platelets, as red cells, as basophils, neutrophils, eosinophils, monocytes, or lymphocytes. So the white, the, the black writing above the blue writing in this area here, this one, these are the cells that you're going to find in your blood. And then at some point, some of them, like the mast cell, the macrophage, you can disregard these things. They're going to end up in tissue. I'm going to show you those in, in a year from now. That's We have like a whole year to get through the rest of this stuff. <laughs> okay. So before I go further, I have another slide I want to show you that refers to more tumorology, very specific to hematopoiesis. I just want to open the floor to questions. Anything at all? Did I lose you? Clear as mud? It's a lot of new content, but this is the exciting stuff. This is the stuff you really want to get into, I think, with microscopes is looking at the cells, understanding how old they are and whether that matters or not. And it does matter a lot because you're going to, this semester specifically, you're only going to be looking for these ones and this one. Small lymphocyte, monocytes, eosinophils, neutrophils, basophils, red cells, and platelets. Those are the ones you're gonna learn this semester. I need you to identify all of them before Christmas. Next semester, you're gonna to start to look at them again, but then you might start to see them a little bit younger, like up here. And the semester after that, you're gonna to start to see more of these. And we're gonna talk about why it matters when they come out so young. And then the semester after that, we're gonna talk about skin and tissues and looking at tumors and stuff like that, okay? Okay, so I got a good for now online. I got some gentle nods here. I think the drone of my voice is sort of making you sleepy. So let me just finish with this one. Hopefully this is gonna tie back into words you're already seeing in etymology. I think I've said it once before, but it, I mean, five weeks have passed, so I've probably said a lot of things that have just gone away in the air. That etymology textbook is the best investment of your money. I think I've said that. It, its chapters are very dense, but it covers everything. So keep it. 
use it for CLP, use it for surgery, use it for pharmacology, use it for rat, because that book has a map of anatomy for all of these species. It just goes right to positional terminology. Like it's a great book. These should be in there. Two key suffixes that you're gonna to start to see that matter very significantly in clinical pathology is penia and philia. Penia meaning too little of, philia meaning too much, which you could probably relate to words that you might have heard in day-to-day -day life because penia and philia are not just related to blood. Those are actual suffixes that can relate to a number of things. But when we're talking about penia, we're talking about any cell that is too low in numbers. So if I said I had thrombocytopenia, what am I too low in? Platelets. Thrombo, there you go, platelets as a cell. Penia, I don't have enough platelet cells. Exact translation. Look at you. It's like I can say all sorts of complicated words now. Right? Oh, okay. <laughs> if I said that I had a neutrophilia, what cell do you think I have too much of? Neutrophils, really high count of neutrophils. Higher than normal. There's an average range for everything. We also sometimes, the last, uh, the next one, the third one down, we also sometimes use the word left shift. I have never heard left shift represented anywhere but pathology, CLP, but it, it's pretty common. You'll see it actually written in medical records. It's a distinguishable um, term that means specifically, we've got a lot of young neutrophils in the blood, which means that we're seeing it in maybe as far up as the blast stage, but it's usually the mega stage or the pro stage. We're just seeing youthful, neutrophils are coming out too early. And if you've got 50% of your cells are young like that, you could say you have a left shift in the blood. Leukemia is the stage of blood cancer, specifically in the blood cells, not necessarily, um, not necessarily on, um, the shape of the bone, but it's got to do with the marrow inside the bone. You know the bones, they're long bones, they have that, they have the outer hard shell and then they have the spongy inside part. We're talking about a disease of the spongy inside part. The reason that matters is because if you've got cancer on the outside part, you can actually see it on an x-ray, but in leukemia, you're not likely to see it on an x-ray because it's inside. But what you will see is cancer changes in the cells themselves. We're gonna learn about what cancer changes look like in your fourth semester. Uh, and then we've got what's called a leukemoid response, which usually means that we are putting out very young white cells, but they are not because of cancer. It's because the body is using the aged cells so quickly and they're trying to send them out faster. So it's actually an inflammatory response, meaning that there's an infection somewhere, body's trying to address it, it has to overproduce or overrelease in order to keep sending white cells. White cells die when they're fighting. I like talking about this stuff, I don't know if you can tell, but it's kind of fun stuff. So once you get into it and, and every cell has a job, and I'm going to teach you what all the cell jobs are, this stuff will fit in just a little bit better. 